Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Dantil Moniz to discuss her glorious debut story collection, Milk Blood Heat, published by our friends at Grove Atlantic. Milk Blood Heat depicts the sultry lives of Floridians in intergenerational tales that contemplate human connection, race, womanhood, inheritance, and the elemental darkness in us all. Don Teal is the recipient of the Alice Hoffman Prize for Fiction, the Cecilia Joyce Johnson Emerging Writer Award by the Key West Literary Seminars, and a Tin House Scholarship. Her fiction has appeared in Tin House, Plowshares, The Yale Review, Joyland, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, and elsewhere. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by none other than the wonderful Lauren Groff, who has called Milk Blood Heat a gorgeous debut. Lauren is the New York Times bestselling author of The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, Fates and Furies, and Florida, as well as the celebrated short story collection, Delicate Edible Birds. Her new novel, Matrix, is forthcoming from Riverhead this September. I'll take a moment to remind you that you can order your copy of Milk Blood Heat from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. Every purchase you make supports Books and Books, so don't be shy. And we thank you for your generous donations too. We'll have time for a Q&A with the audience following the talk. So please post your questions anytime during the broadcast in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll get to those right after the talk. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome. Hi. 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 It is so good. Congratulations oh, thank on this you. beautiful book, this beautiful um, celebration of life in Florida and just life in general. Um, you look spectacular tonight. How do you feel? I don't know yet. <laughs> that's, that's just, I don't know. I'm still processing, but pretty good, I think. I mean, yeah. We're, yeah. I feel pretty good. I can't yeah. wait to hear you read your story. So can we can we get started with just a, one of the readings so that um, everyone in the audience can hear how brilliant your work is in your own voice? Yes. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, so I will read just an excerpt from the story, The Hearts of Our Enemies. You don't need any setup for this part. Um, six weeks ago, she had crept into Margot's room, pulling the door open with a knob twisted far to the right so that the catch wouldn't click and alert her daughter or the friend who'd slept over. Every surface was covered with something. Fashion scarves and mislaid jackets, scattered textbooks, lip stain and shades Frankie would not have been allowed to wear at her daughter's age, one the gleaming crimson of newly plucked cranberry. Margot slept beautifully, of course, flung wide over the small bed, covers tangled between legs and one brown arm trailing over the edge, the other resting across her friend's stomach. Marissa was long and dark and beautiful too. Wrapped in a yellow gossamer gown, Frankie wasn't aware girls still wore for sleep. Margot wore an over oversized t-shirt and a pair of her father's old briefs, ignoring years of camisoles and matching pajama sets crammed at the back of her nightstand. And she snored, her face half buried in her pillow, mouth open in a ring of moisture. Her one visible eyelid fluttered, crusted with sleep that hinted of late night talk. Frankie remembered what it was like, whispering about the pros and cons of false eyelashes and girls at school with false faces and how many sit-ups equaled one slice of cafeteria pizza and which teachers were fucking which other teachers and boys' names they said before sleep and would they one day be fucked too and would they like it? She and her friends used to compare their bodies in the mirror side by side so they would know what normal was. Frankie wondered if girls still did this, still deadened their arms and touched themselves as if testing unfamiliar fruit. To look on Margot in the filtered sun was like holding your breath underwater, she thought. A tightness in the chest, a small amount of panic, but bigger than that was the wonder at how light the body could be, held up by all that matter. 
the feel of it touching you everywhere at once, the soles of your feet, the inside of your nose, how you, suspended in the deep, could truly feel your heart working. That was how Frankie felt watching her daughter sleep, a little afraid, a little hurt, exhilarated. She wanted to kiss the sloped forehead under which all those attributes that made her daughter too bright and difficult convened and pulsed. She didn't. Even in sleep, Margot projected warning, do not touch me. Frankie slipped from the room as quietly as she had entered it, went back to her chair in the kitchen. She wanted a cigarette, but instead had a third cup of coffee, dark Arabian roast flavored with honey and cinnamon. She thought of the crepe she would make for her daughter and the friend, a peace offering in the only language in which she was absolutely fluent. In the fridge were heavy cream and strawberries she'd gotten from the farmer's market that morning, sweet smelling and dense red. The counter was flowered and the griddle set on the stove, all of it waiting only for the girls to awaken. She needed to be busy, to fill the space with hearthy smells, to set her hands to useful work. They didn't wake for nearly an hour. In that time, the cordless rang twice, summoning her to check the caller ID before answering the first call, her mother, and not answering the second, her husband. The message light blinked like an active tracking device. At noon, she heard movement, the muted musical signature of girls and the thrall of serious conversation. Frankie pressed herself to the wall to feel the hum of their words coming through, to know their vibrational setting, but she couldn't feel it. She wasn't tuned in. She peeled herself away and waited by the stove, hand clasped above the warm bowl of her belly. The girls appeared some minutes later, still in their sleeping things, Margot's hair wrapped and Marissa's combed down and gleaming, her daughter flicking those precious crusts from the corners of her eyes. Frankie found herself suddenly overwhelmed by the girl, a creature once of her own body and now nearly 18 and too big to sit on her lap or let go of a grudge easily. What a gorgeous thing she'd made. She tried to remember what it was like before her daughter despised her, the small years when she was revered as a mother god and said to the girls, good morning, though it wasn't anymore. Margot's face creased as she crossed to the kitchen counter to rifle through the bread box, presenting her back to her mother. I'm making crepes, Frankie tried again, indicating the griddle. She felt like a game show hostess, grandstanding to highlight all the prizes her daughter could win if only she would stomach one unbearable act of kindness if she would just let Frankie feed her. Margot selected an everything bagel from the box. We don't want crepes. She still did not look at her mother. Her friend leaned against the door frame, one arm wrapped around herself, looking steadfastly out the window like a politician. Nothing to see here, business as usual. What was a three month long cold war between a mother and daughter except standard operating procedure? I'm gonna stop there. It was very beautiful, very good. I am. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was, it. Yes. was that your first reading from the book? Um, or did you do others? No, yeah, I've read it. I'm read from it a couple of times. Okay. Well, that was really good. You're you sound, you're you're wonderful. As with a debut, you're slow, you're good. Um all right, so I'm so happy that you read that because there are so many themes uh, in that excerpt in that story that um, reverberate throughout the rest of the book, and um, I hope that we get to talk about that some of them tonight. But something that I, I noticed on this read, which I hadn't um, noticed when I was reading in my own internal voice, is uh, uh, that amazing line about Frankie. At one point, she had been a mother god uh, to her daughter. Which brings to mind, of course, your epigraph, which is so brilliant. It's from Zora Neale Hurston, right? Half gods are worshipped in wine and flowers. Real gods require blood. And I think that's from their eyes were watching God. Is that yes? Yeah. Um, so what? So so tell me about um, Florida. Being a Florida writer like Zora Neale Hurston, we're just going to get this one out of the out of yeah. the room because this is this is yeah. I think the reason why I was asked um other than the fact that I adore you and your book um it's because books and books is a Florida bookstore we love them so deeply um you your a lot of your stories are set in Jacksonville um and around Jacksonville and you know I'm in Gainesville so this is sort of the thread that binds us all so talk to me about Florida Zora everything 
Yeah. So first and foremost, it was really important for me for my first event, like my debut, like the launch event to be a completely Floridian experience. That's why I was like, yes, books and books. Yes, Lauren. Yeah. Let's, you know, do this thing. Because I think for me growing up, um, I say this all the time, but it's, it's absolutely true. You know, Florida was is never like presented as a literary state that, you know, writers come from here or writers um, that you can write about this place other than out in anything other than out of mockery, you know what I mean? You know, you know what I mean. You live here, so it's like Florida man memes, which is true, right? There, there is a Florida man. We, we are a really interesting state. It's a very diverse state. Like, uh, just the topography of the place is different. You have swamps. You know, you have city. You have all of that stuff. Um, but I think that everybody has Florida man. But it's just very easy to like pick on Florida and be like, let's, you know, let's cut it off and get rid of it. But I think it was really important to understand that, like, no, there are stories worth telling here. There are so many stories that we haven't even tapped in. Because the other thing that's a little annoying is like, oh, well, you're writing about Florida. Well, that's already been done now by these authors. And I'm like, OK, are you saying the same thing about New York? Are you saying that same thing about California and Vermont and wherever people set their stories about people having experiences in their lives? No, you're not. You're not saying it in that same way. So it was important for me to be like, this is where I come from. I have really complicated feelings about it, but I still want to write about it. It's still worth, you know, writing about. Yeah. And I think that all of your stories are very, very rich in specific Florida feel. Um, do you find that, you know, the humidity, the fecundity, all of that stuff is sort of is, is rich for your short stories? I mean, do you, do you feel like it, it, it creates sort of the pressure to, to, to create? I mean, yeah. I mean, think about like when you're when you are in this state, it's a, a summer day, whatever it is, you walk outside of your house and it's like the air is on you. It's like just this visceral feeling. It's it's like this weight. Um, which I write about it a lot in the story collection, but then, you know, me too, being in Northeast Florida, um, it gets cold here. So that same like humidity that's in the air, um, it's cold and people are like, oh, it doesn't get cold in Florida. I was like, actually try like coming from where you are to down here, dry cold and wet cold are very different things. And you know what I mean? So there's just this atmosphere about the weather that it's like a character. I know that's so cliche to be like the heat is a character in the work, but it kind of is. It, it, it pressurizes a lot of things. Like, you know, like if it's really hot and you're having like a bad day and then ugh, you're sweating and you feel like you can't breathe, like that affects you. That affects how you like interact with the world and engage with it. So yes, is the answer to that question. Absolutely. Uh, it's also, and in the excerpts that you read too, um, the, it showed off something that you do so well is that you situate your stories in the carnal body, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that is so beautiful and so strong in this book is that every everything is um, brought through the senses. And uh, one of your characters, and I'm, I'm not remembering the name of the, the story. It's one of my favorite stories. Ah. I'm like often. I, know, yeah. I'm so bad I, don't I don't know the title of that song, but I can sing it for you. You know, it's like know, exactly. uh, well, she she like she's focusing on her sweat and her smell, and it, it's, oh, um, thicker than water. Yes, yeah, I was about to say that, uh, but I didn't want to make a mistake. Um, yeah, so uh, but but there's food, right? Even Frankie is a chef, and she was making these crepes out of it. Like this is a this is a way to to feed um the people that she loves and her. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I feel like Florida is a carnal place. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And you're so brilliant at sort of showing that, that, that nature off too. Um, so the other thing too, one of the other things that um, was so fascinating is um, with this excerpt too, is that uh, there's the the ongoing theme of tension between a mother and her daughter, which is something that happens a lot over the course of the book. Um, can you tell me what how that is uh, so rich to you as a writer? What 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 brings you to that? Yeah, so I think one of the first books that I read where I understood you're allowed to write about complicated relationships with your mother was White Oleander. Um, I, I came across that book when I was 14 in my high school library. And I remember picking it up and being, you know, reading a few pages and be like, oh, this is a mistake. Like they don't know that this book isn't, this is here. They would not let us have this book. But um, 
Yeah, it's 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 important because I think about you know my relationship with my mother and how formative that is. I mean, that's that seems like a simple thing to say, but it's like if you think about your own behavior and your own decision making process and all of that stuff, it stems back to whatever you were mirroring in the home. And then it also is this other thing of like, you know, it, and maybe this is just with like cis straight people, but like I found that as soon as I got married and I got I got married pretty young, I was 23, um, it immediately was like, when are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? When are you gonna have kids? And I'm like, whoa, like, that's a whole responsibility. It's not just like, oh, you have kids because that's the next logical step. So for me, it's this tug between being a daughter and being a mother and like how that connected connectivity like all like comes together. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like I never answer these questions. It's brilliant. It was good. Well, because that's also something that is in a, a lot of the stories, sort of the the pressure and the desire, but also the ambivalence about becoming a yeah. mom. Too. I mean, it's it's not just a single flow upward to you know and to mom, right? It's also like the the idea of what it means to bring life into this particular exactly, yeah. and not even just bring life because that's a thing that you can do. You can bring life, but what about sustaining and nourishing and like making a healthy life that you brought into the world? Because you know people are brought into the world all the time, and then it's like you're on your own. You know what I mean? So yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I found that really wonderful and beautifully threaded through the book, too. And another thing, too, that I think that you do so extraordinarily well is um, that you write about friendships between girls. Right? I mean, a number of these stories hinge on the, this relationship. Um, the title story, Milk, Blood, Heat, Outside the Raft, and Almanac of Bones. So tell me what's so fascinating to you about these these relationships. I mean, almost anyone that's ever like had a girlhood like and made friends in this way is like, those are really intense friendships. It's not just like, you're my best friend, but there's like this, almost like the separation between you and that person disappears or the lines get blurred. So it's just like very intense, very formative. It can be so tender and yet switch to be like this kind of a violence that mm -hmm. I don't know, that is, that is often the case, or at least it was for me, like some of my girl friendships where I was like, oh man, this is my, you know, this is the person, but it also was like a little bit tension and like push pull and like, you know, sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't, but there was still love in that, in that couched inside of that like difficulty. I don't know how I explain it. It's just like, that's the way it is. It's super intense. It's it's um, sometimes hard to get your footing, but then you can completely get lost in somebody and and see yourself as a mirror. Like it's friendships as mirrors. You're learning how to be through interacting with whomever this person is. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. And it goes back to a lot of the other ideas and themes in the book about this beautifully modulated doubleness, right? I mean, if you yeah. look at a mother, that's that's a that's a double of you in a certain um, sometimes horrifying way. Yeah, like, oh my god! It's like it's like that moment in the hearts of, my, of um, our enemies where you know Frankie is sitting in her car and Margot is seeing her, but Frankie doesn't know she's being watched. And Margot has this thought like, "Oh my god, my mom is a person." You know what I mean? Like the, I I remember very specifically the first time that I was like, "Oh my god, this is my mom's first time on." in this life also. And she's like doing the best she can. Like, you know what I mean? Even if it wasn't always what I needed, she, it's the first time she's trying, I think, you know what I mean? So. That was one of those moments that I've carried with me ever since I first read this book, I think a year ago at this point, um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe even longer. Um, just that, that idea, this is my mother's first time in the world also. It, and it seems like such a simple, idea but it's actually extraordinarily deep and sad and that was the first time i ever thought it about my own mom <laughs> you know? yeah yeah it's a real thing you think yeah it is a simple concept of oh she's a person this is also her first you know wh whether you believe in reincarnation all that stuff but as this person in this body in this life like that's your first time but it's hard to get to sometimes the simplest things like that are very convoluted with all of the the things that we expect from the people that are in our lives. 
Yeah, it, shine, it, it was it was a very bright light into um, uh, sort of a source of empathy that um, I personally hadn't felt before in that direction. And I, so thank you for that. That was really beautiful. But that's what we get from reading really, really yeah. literature. Um, do you want to do your your second reading now, and then we can come back to other yeah. Okay. Yeah, some water because. <laughs> All right, so we talked a little bit about uh, Thicker Than Water very briefly. So I'm gonna read an excerpt from that. So all you need to know for this part I'm gonna read is that um, the main character and her brother have been estranged for about a year following the death of their father. And their mother has said, you know, enough, you need to go spread your father's ashes like you wanted to. So they're gonna drive from Tallahassee to Santa Fe to go do this. Um, but the twist is that the brother has brought his girlfriend along and you know the main character didn't know anything about that. So they're in the car in this scene. Shelby doesn't believe in evasion, which I find out when I tell her how lucky it was she could get the time off work for this trip and ask her what she does. We're on I-10, driving west through the panhandle, out the window, unremarkable stretches of field. I'm a foot fetish model, she says, and I gawp at her rosy little toes, her feet propped up on Lucas's dash, old smudges on the windshield from past contact like abstract art. Her nails are painted a vivid acid green, which is not her usual color. Her clients like French tips and hot tamale red. She tells me she had a friend who had a cousin who got her started, but after she blew up, she got her own sight. Shelby breaks down the specifics of her job, the brand of pantyhose her clients prefer, level of packages she offers, how much people pay for nothing more than watching her stroke Lucy's fur against her high arches. She explains the smelly feet trope. Like, you know, I've just gotten back from a long run and gosh, my feet are so tired, so sweaty. And then I make a big production of taking off my runners and my socks and all that. I can't tell you how many socks I sell. She says she does some of the normal shit too, lace and leather, oh baby, I'm so hot for you, just with more feet. It's great, she says, nodding. It pays the rent and I can set my own hours, plus all the cute shoes and petties I want. You know, people will buy stuff off your Amazon wish list. I try to catch my brother's eye in the rear view to see what he thinks about all of this, but he's resolutely not looking in my direction. I can't tell anything from the side of his face, but his right hand hasn't moved from Shelby's thigh. What do you do, she asks. And I say, basically clean up shit for a living, play with people's human and fur babies. And she says, that's awesome, like she means it. And I find myself liking her for my brother. By hour two of the drive, she's turned around in her seat, talking exclusively to me as Lucas hasn't felt the need to participate. I appreciate her attention, which keeps me from feeling like a child in the back seat. It turns out that Shelby is also a purveyor of random knowledge. Interesting facts she collects off Wikipedia and Reddit chat rooms. She knows about winemaking, the chemical makeup of methamphetamine, what the stars of the real world Key West are up to now, and about the golden age architecture of Roman Catholic churches. Shelby says, so I'm sure you've heard about all life originating in Africa, but have you thought about what that means? That like the first gods were black too? I can tell she's wanted to ask me this probably since we'd met. She wants me to know that she's an ally, that for her, my brother is not a fetish. She wants me to be impressed. I want to tell her that she doesn't have to try so hard. Lucas and I both grew up exoticized in a mostly white school system, so this is far from our first white partner rodeo. I want to recount all the ridiculous things we've heard over the years as proof of allyship, the black best friends and A pluses earned in Spanish lit, but she's been nice to me, so I humor her. I tell her, borrowing from Hurston, gods often reflect the people who create them. She doesn't catch the reference. I ask her more about herself, Tell her what I've been up to lately as if we're old friends catching up. I'm speaking to her, but I imagine her as a medium between Lucas and me. What I hope he has missed coming through a messenger he's more willing to receive. The three of us have steel bladders, so it's a while before we stop. When we cross into Mississippi, we pull into a dingy gas station off the highway just outside Lucidale. None of us have ever heard of the chain. We all get out to grab snacks and stretch our legs. Shelby and I walk to the restroom while Lucas pays for gas at the counter. The cashier's eyes flick over us, cowboy mustache bristling. He doesn't speak, only takes my brother's money. Once in the stall, squatting over the discolored seat, my curiosity is finally stronger than my repulsion. And I ask Shelby through the wall, did you meet my brother off the foot site? Oh no, Shelby says, laughing. I can hear her wiping, flushing. I never meet clients in real life. 
They met at Floyd's, a college club on the strip where one of my brother's friends was DJing and started dating just before our father died. She tells me sometimes Lucas appears in her videos, faceless, doing things to her or letting them happen to him. I don't ask her any more questions, and I speak just so she'll stop. Lucas was never the jealous type, I tell her, which is true, except when it concerned the affections of our father. While we're washing our hands with the diluted scentless soap, Shelby asks, what about you, seeing anyone special? Define special, I say, trying to sound light. My foundation is holding up and my hair still looks great. Maybe she'll think I'm a cool, shoot from the hip, love them and leave them kind of girl. I haven't had a serious relationship since before our father got sick. And even then, I didn't like to lay myself out that way. Love requires a bareness, a certain pliability, and I didn't thrill at the possibility of being transformed or wiped away. I look at myself in the mirror, but instead see Arlo's tired face, the drawn long pull of it after he and our mother had fought. The two of us are in the living room alone, late afternoon, the light amber in my hair while I play dolls at his feet. I am six and happy, and he clutches my chin and tells me, if I could, I'd marry you. Shelby lowers her voice conspiratorially. Okay, so here's a tip. Attraction is all about chemicals. We're just like animals, you know? She explains that humans secrete pheromones in urine and in sweat, and even if we're not aware of it, our bodies react. So, she says, what I do is get that clean sweat after a light workout. I spritz a little essential oil, but leave my original musk. Here, smell. She beckons me closer and lifts her arm, and to my own amazement, I lean into her smooth white pit. Under citrus, I detect a smell that's a cross between chlorine and celery. Not welcome, but maybe not unpleasant either. And that's how I got your brother. She winks at me and flips her thin hair, which moves and shines as if liquid. I'll keep that in mind, I tell her. I wish I could unknow everything she said, but her sharing has given us allegiance to one another. As we walk out, she threads her arms through mine and I let her. Back in the car, my brother cranks the AC and gives Shelby a look. You took long enough. I thought that clerk was going to shoot me. Sorry, babe, Shelby says, and pops the top on a can of seltzer. She offers him a swig, which he takes. Then she reaches into the lunch our mother packed and grabs a tangerine. Once peeled and quartered, she guides a slice between Lucas's lips and the bright juice bursts across his chin. Shelby wipes it away and absentmindedly licks her finger afterward. And I look out the window because such lazy intimacy is too much to bear. You want one of these sandwiches? Shelby asks me, like they're hers to give, but I don't respond. I'm too busy wondering what it's like to be so comfortable in your own body you don't try to mask the sense of its functioning, but instead make a profit off them. I was always fearful of my own smells, of how they condemned or conspired against me. Our mother instilled in me early what evils might come sniffing, though she never illuminated the specifics. In her stories, they were hungry shadows who preyed on incautious girls. What I knew I'd learned from our father, National Geographic, two lions roaring on screen, the male biting the lioness's neck, Arlo pointing, his dry voice in my ear. They're having sex. It looked painful, scary, bad. This was the evil our mother meant. I see myself 14, 15, in the bathroom, perched on the closed toilet. My underwear is a tangle around my ankles and in the cotton seat, a teaspoon of off-white glop. Sometimes it had a shimmer like pearl and when I brought it to my nose, it smelled of egg or nothing at all. A boy at school had just begun reciprocating my clumsy flirtations and I needed to know if any of this was normal. I call for my mother to join me and when she enters, I can't look her in the eye. Already I know that what is between my legs is a hunched back sinner, a thing to hide, but I stand and face her, offering my underwear in one hand and parting myself with the other. Does this look okay? Our mother curls her lip, but even then I didn't think she meant it. It's fine, she says and leaves immediately, not wanting to perform the double work of shaming me since I've already shamed myself. I love that you read that because that is with um, the first story of Blood Heat. It's, um, those are my two like devastating stories. I love them so much. I love all of the stories, but these, the, those are the good ones. The ones that like, like yeah. yeah, I know what you know. Yeah, I know. What no, you mean. I love them all. Yeah, they're all great. Um, the protagonist actually in that story paraphrases Emerson. Um, she says, I think it's the story. She says, truth is beautiful, but so are lies. Um, tongues. What's that? It's tongues. It's uh, tongues. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It wasn't that one. Yeah. So many quotes. Do you believe that though? 
truth is beautiful yet is our lives um i mean yeah i mean look at this country honestly <laughs> i mean yeah i think that it's easier sometimes to be like yeah i'm going to believe this thing about myself rather than the truth because it's sometimes painful to have to look at yourself honestly like yeah do you think um this uh, ability to contain all of that all at once is the reason why you write fiction? I think so. Like, what do you mean as opposed to maybe nonfiction? Or, this, yeah. or why I'm drawn to writing, period? Why you're drawn to writing, period, I think. And yeah. why, why fiction and why short stories? So I'm, I'm trying to lead myself into like why short stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I really don't know. I like, I've just always been this way. I, I understand it's sometimes very hard for me to understand what I'm thinking unless I can write it down and organize it. And then in that way that I can understand what I think and what I feel. Mm -hmm. um, so the writing composure has always just been a thing, but like short stories in general, I never would have said I was gonna be a short story writer. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to be a writer from very young, but obviously it's like, oh, you're gonna write a novel because that's the only thing people ever say. It's like, yeah, a novel, a novel. I didn't even know what short stories were until I started taking workshops. Um, but there's just something about the short story that I feel like I love that with a short story, it's asking you to do some work as the reader, right? It's not just like this, you get to find out exactly how this ends and exactly what this character is gonna do. Most of them end in a way where you have to, it allows you the room to imagine the next choices this character is gonna make off the page. And I love the idea of characters living somewhere off the page because a lot of the times in the best um, stuff that I read, it's like, these, these are people for me. And I love the idea of like them living lives. Um, and continuing to make choices. And sometimes it's so heartbreaking to know by the end of a page, th though the author didn't like write it e explicitly, like you know that that character is gonna make a choice that's gonna get them to further it into trouble. And it's just like, wow, that's sad. <laughs> I like, I feel for you, like it's tender. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do stories do that novels can't? And I'm asking this actually, cause I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so I know what you think. Um, I think, yeah, I think it just has to go back to the like, uh, maybe there's more room for the reader in the story, but I also could be talking shit. I, I could be just saying something just to say. <laughs> I don't know, I don't, I don't know, right? I don't know. I don't know it's very individual and it's very yeah. uh, dependent on the story and the novel at a hand. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the okay. answer. Do things announce themselves to you as stories or do you, do you just get a narrative and you follow it until it's done? I think I have, I think when an idea comes to me, it's, it's piecemeal, right? It's, I have like an image or an interesting line or a bit of dialogue or whatever. And I put it in a folder on my notes or I just put it in my notes. And then somehow my brain does this on its own. I'm like actually really impressed that it does this, but it'll remember whatever, like not explicitly, but the next time an idea comes to me and then it connects with whatever that other idea is, I was like, oh, these two things are related. And then I move them to a separate folder. Now they are, now I'm collecting ideas for that. So I don't think I know if it's going to be a short story or a novel, but I think in the last few years, my mind is immediately like in the sh short story form automatically. I'm like, okay, what can I do with this story? So much so that <laughs> this novel that I'm trying to write is like, how do y'all do it? That it's for the birds. I'm like, how is that a thing? I mean, I want to do it. I want to try, but let's be perfectly honest. It's really hard to write while you've got a book coming out. It's just psychologically very difficult. So, like, give yourself a break. It's totally fine. you're fine. I'm great, I'm fine. great. Um, I actually have to open it up uh, to questions yeah. from the audience. So, so, if you have questions, audience, please ask them. Um, I don't think I'm supposed to do it. Am I? I think you are. I oh, think yeah, you, are. yeah okay. you do it. Like you know you what? We didn't really talk about that. <laughs> so can, either can, you can do it or I can do it. Whatever you comfortable do. with. Yeah. If you can just like access the ask a question and it. take some. Awesome. I got it. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do okay. it. Andrew Pearl asks, does Ms. Moniz have experience with screenwriting? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to experience a screenwriter? Um, 
Maybe in high school, I wrote a couple of like, I took a playwriting class. And so I know that's not like the same thing, but like, you know what I mean? It's a different adjacent type of thing, but like, yeah, maybe I actually do see myself in the future, like doing something with film. Like I, I get just as much writing technique from film as I do books. Like it's, I have a very visual way that I do that. So maybe, so the answer is no, or the answer is not yet. How about that? I think our mutual friend, T. Kara Madden, um, she, she, uh, she complimented our sparkle. And I have to tell you, I came on in a place tell and story. so good. She made me go back and get dressed in a sparkly dress. I came on and Lauren was in her jacket and she was like, you know, huddled out in her chair. She's like, oh, oh no, oh my God. She just like left and she came back in a sparkly thing. <laughs> I've been worn earrings in a year. I didn't think that it was going to happen, but it did. All right. Um, oh, and our mutual friends, the other, another Florida writer, Kristen Darnett asked, uh, says, you write about Florida in this collection so beautifully. What is your process for structuring place in your work? Um, Kristen, very good question. Um, one of the things that publishing a book has made me do is I have to think consciously about things that are very unconscious for me. So that's so thank you. Um, I actually would have said that I'm not really good at writing setting or place as I'm, I'm so like usually in a character's head or internal space that I sometimes like forget that there's like an outside world, but it was, is a lot easier to do with this place that I'm from that I have a lot of strong feelings about. Um, I just wanted, I didn't want to get so caught up in like street names in this building. I didn't really want like, so much accuracy like if somebody might be like that bridge is not there that bridge is like you know three streets over i'm like that's fine that's okay i'm building like an atmosphere it's more the atmosphere of this place and the heat and bodies and um just like the animals like i'm thinking about um the story oh my god i don't know my own story's title necessary bodies where the pond you know she's thinking about the minnows and the carp so it's, it's more of like um, a tactile feeling for me, how I think about place and setting more than like, let me be very accurate about these street names. I don't know if I answered you, Kristen, I'm sorry, but I, I do adore you. I think you answered beautifully. I think that was um, excellent. And I also think that, that, that goes back to the, the the way that you handle sensory detail in, in all of your stories. I think it's just very, very evident that that's the way you think through the body. And yeah. then, right? Um, yeah. Because well, it's the body is our only. Um, this is where we live. We live inside. We are not our bodies, but like, like we live inside of them. They're very important, and it's very easy to think of your body as not living, like as a product. Like that was my challenge all of all of last year. Was I was like, oh, this is a real thing that requires something of me, that needs something of me, so it can continue functioning in a in a you know a healthy way. And so like yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, so Kat Lewis asks, uh, can you talk about your revision process for your stories? Yes. Um, so I know like in MFAs, a lot of the time they like, oh, turn off your editor, you know, mind so you can be in your creating mind. And that's great general advice. Um, but I am the type of person that the sentences are so important to me, like sentence by sentence, I need to build up a story, which is probably why I have a hard time with the novel because you can't really do that with a novel. But um, my revision process is usually a little bit clean because each time I go into a story when I'm writing it, I start at the top and I'm changing stuff as I read it. And then I get to where I left off and I start writing again. And I do that every time just because it helps me be immersed into the story and into the character. And then I just can't help it. Like if I'm like, oh, this does not sound right. Cause sound is so important to me too in how I construct sentences. So if the sound's not right, I have to change it. Like it bothers me and I can't, I can't keep writing. But yeah, so my revision process is, is to do some variant of that. I, um, I like to start writing on a fresh um, page because I think that it offers me the ability to think outside of what I've already written. So I have the old draft pulled up and I have a blank page and then I'm, and then I'm writing through the revision. That's how I do revision. It's great. Yeah, that works really beautifully because you just sort of, as you're writing, you're sort of cr cracking open the things. That yeah, there, yeah, new things are happening and jumping off. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't like to go in. It, it doesn't feel like enough room to go into the same dot to make changes. It feels like cramped. Yeah. To me. 
Uh, okay, so Felipe Barreda asks, uh, when you write a story, how do you see it through to the finish? He says, as a writer, it is easy for him to come up with an idea to write about, but then he gets stuck in trying to find an editing, ending. How do you do that? Yeah, um, I feel like a lot of the times for me, my process is that I know how a story starts, I know how it ends, and I'm, I'm really writing my way to connect the two. Um, so as far as like, and sometimes the endings change, sometimes the beginnings change, but like, I usually already kind of know where I want to start and where I want to end. Um, so I know that's not helpful in that way, but I think in terms of like seeing a story through, it's just about allowing yourself to play, especially in your drafts. Like I know you could be like, this is a very serious thing, but like, you're also, you also enjoy doing this and it's, it's, it's helpful to remember that you enjoy it and to allow yourself to be really messy and sprawling in, in whatever your first drafts are. Um, and then like to find whatever that heat is for you. What's the thing that you wake up? Like sometimes I go to sleep thinking about an idea for a story that I have and I wake up and it's still there. So like, what's the heat for you in that story that's going to be able to carry you through to whatever ending you find? Yeah, beautiful. Um, so Suzanne Grove says uh, she read The Loss of Heaven in the winter 2020 issue of the Paris Review Yay! Um, for the first time last night and felt so grateful to have discovered your writing. Um, Suzanne loves your use of language, the detail and specificity that brings so much life to each story. She always reads poetry and excerpts from her favorite writers. Skip that before I write for the before she writes for the day. So she's wondering if you have a specific pre-writing routine or any favorites that inspire you to get to the page. Yeah, um, it changes from time to time, but my process is I'm an afternoon writer, so around two o'clock, and I like to write in coffee shops. That's the other thing that's been terrible about um, the year for my writing process. Um, but you know, I, I have my tea or my coffee or whatever it is I'm drinking. I light a little candle. And then I always read a little bit before I start. So much of my writing process is just like not writing before I'm like actually writing, but like I'll keep just stories that have beautiful sentences. Like you've been on my desk before Lauren, uh, you know, why Oleander, like so many different stories, just whoever I'm reading at the time, I'm like, oh, this is a gorgeous sentence. I just want to be immersed in gorgeous sentences because I read people who are writing gorgeous sentences and I'm like, I'm jealous, I gotta do it, let's do it. You know what I mean? I was like, let me, let me go in and do it. Um, so yeah, I do read beforehand, but I try not to, I don't know, it doesn't have, I know some people are like, oh, reading somebody else's stuff, kind of like their voice rubs off on me. It's not like that for me. It's just like, oh, this is really inspiring that people can create this with language and I want to do it. Lovely. So this is actually another um, Tin House workshop reunion, Ooh. which is so lovely. This is Carrie Moore, who's amazing. Um, she says, congratulations, this is so amazing. I love how satisfyingly unsettling your writing is. It's so hard to capture what often goes unsaid because people are afraid to look at some topics head on. Did you experience any fear when writing about some of the topics in your collection? Fear of being exposed or anything like that? And congrats. 100%. There are a couple of things that I wrote that I was like, are you allowed to do this? Are you going to get like banned from the earth for depicting this? And then at the same time, I have to counter that with, well, if you're thinking it or wondering about it or imagining it, probably other people are too, but there's that whole stigma of you are not allowed to say certain things or be a certain way. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put it, they can cancel me if they want to. That's not my problem though. Like my thing that I have to do is like, I have to write the book and this is what I'm being called to like write right now. So, but yes, a hundred percent. There are, yeah, there are several things where I was like, eh, Oh, well, I'm just going to do it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, it's a certain amount of just, you know, doing it and then being like, does it work? Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to show your mom yet. Uh, not until it's published, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, there are a few more, but I think I only have time for one or two. Um, but I think this question from Alex is interesting. When writing about the body, how do you balance between physicality of details and moving the plot forward? Ooh. Ooh. That is an interesting question that I wish I had a really like academic answer for or like a real thought out like this is what I do. But um I don't really have that answer. I can just say that for me, so much of these stories revolve around what happens in the body, how we are in our bodies, how we are with other people's bodies that 
that's kind of plot for me in this way that I know is not traditionally plot, like it's moving forward, but there is movement happening. There is energy happening. Even if it's a character who's suddenly having these different revelations about their lives or their connections to other people in their lives, that's, that's still movement. It's just not what we think of as like Hollywood plot. You know what I mean? So, but that's all, that's, sorry. That's all I got. No, no that was the perfect answer. It's good. Okay, so um, let's do, let's finish with a question about love. Uh, yes. What do you love about Florida that you think will always inevitably bleed into your work? I know people talk shit about the heat, but I really love it. Like I, I can withstand like some really hot temperatures and it's just something about like being forced to be so present in my body that I think we take for granted. It's very easy to be spacey and spaced out, but like it's very hard to do that when it's like, who okay my body is like an animal and it's having feelings and plus you can like you can wear some of the best clothes and he you or, can like <laughs> non clothes you know what i mean but like <laughs> can. um yeah i think i think i will just end the beach i know that's like oh florida beach but like seriously like salt water like the whole the ambient noise the whole thing Ooh, which beach, sorry which beach do you like um like just for like basic, we're just going to the beach, just Jack's Beach. But there is that, um, what's that Driftwood Beach here in Jacksonville? I should know the names of these places, but there's a beach and it has all these old trees that have fallen and it's like the most beautiful twisty looking like wonderland looking beach. And it's it's beautiful. I wish I, Big Talbot Island, ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just for like swimming and boogie boarding and whatever, just, just Jack's Beach. Yeah. Um, I have trauma from beaches, but I'm glad you like them. Good. I almost lost children in a riptide. It was terrible. Okay. Um, okay. But <laughs> let's do one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's. Uh, someone says they love the title, and yeah. I love the title too. Can you talk about it? Yes. Yeah, so actually, the title you have to thank my friend Sarah for this being the title because I was like, oh, I'm gonna call it an almanac of bones because that's just real cool. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, but just, just let's just spitballing here. Milk blood heat. I just feel like that runs through every single collection. It's it's elemental. It's it's milk which nourishes the body. It's the blood of the body. It's heat and not just of Florida, but like of living bodies. And then I was like, I don't know, I don't know. And then I went to sleep. And I guess my brain was thinking about it all night and I woke up and I had to text her and be like, you right. It's the perfect title. It's the title, it's the title, so. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. Oh, you so so happy with you. um, I hope this book re meet, meets all of the readers that will love it as much as I do. Um, and I hope that you have a wonderful time on your the rest of your tour. Uh, and you know, we're here for you. And I really Thanks. wish I could say, like, everybody, fold up your chairs. Let's go into the next room. Let's do the autographing. I wish I could give you a big hug. Me too. But it'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah. Sure. Next time. A glass of bourbon so, with you. Happy, yes. so happy okay. big birthday. And Thank please, you so much. people, everybody watching, don't forget, you can order the book from Books and Books. We'll ship Thanks it right out to you. Stores. Support yes. Them. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we love debuts. They are so exciting. Mm -hmm. There's a brand new voice, you know, coming in to the world. Um, and so congratulations, truly. So and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And for everybody watching from everywhere, um, milk, blood, heat. Okay. And stay well. <laughs> Be well. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I will see you soon at the coffee shop. And yeah. some books. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you.